everyone who's in my book, or at least people who, you know, our book is told in a, in a loose chronological order. And so the people who are still in my life, you know, my parents, my friends, my wife, um, they all got a, got a heads up that this chapter, mm-hmm. you know, that, hey, this book is happening. This is a passage that you're in. Take a look at it. Your basketball partners as well? Okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. <laughs> get to that. <laughs> that's, 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 that's different. <laughs> okay. So so the black the black people in my life. <laughs> First, I was like, hey, I plan on writing about this thing. How do you feel about that? Cool. Okay. And then I actually went and wrote the thing. And then after I went and wrote the thing, I came back. It's like, you know what? This is the second draft. Here it is. Once you sign off on this, there's no, there's no going back. This is it. So mm-hmm. how, how do you feel about this? And I, I got unanimous, you know, unanimous approval where people were just like, yeah, just tell your story. Just, you know, be yourself, whatever. Um, and so, so yeah, I did get that. Um, but it, it's easy. Like I've, I, it's easy for people to come at me. It's e- it, It's gotten easier to, 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 to have my work and my vulnerabilities and my person critiqued. Um, the difficult part is, you know, people knowing stuff about my dad, mm. stuff about my wife, knowing stuff about my friends. Um, and, and so uh, to, to try to mitigate that a bit, I go at myself harder. I, mm-hmm. I'm more critical of myself. I'm much more, you know, conscious of my errors and, and places where I fucked up. And, and, I, and I hope, you know, I hope that mitigates that a bit. It, it made me feel a little better about including, you know, other people who are still close to me um, in my work. Um, now, as far as the, the the basketball buddies, and for people who haven't read the book, I have an entire chapter devoted to this this regular pickup basketball game that I that I play Thursday nights, and it's a mostly white group of guys. Um, I'm not the only black guy, but again, it's I'd say it's 80 85 percent white guys who who show up to this to this to this regular pickup game, and, and it's. And for people who play basketball, finding a good regular pickup game is like finding a diamond. <laughs> like finding a diamond within a diamond. I mean, once you find a thing like that, you you it's precious. You preserve it. You don't give it up. You do whatever it takes to continue it, um, to cultivate it, protect it. And so I had this regular Thursday night game, but then 2016, early 2016. I learned that one of the guys is a pretty diehard Trump guy. And now, okay, I'm, if you're anywhere in America and you're doing a thing with white men, there is a great likelihood that a few, at least a few of them are going to be Republicans, are going to be conservative. I mean, most white men in America are. Most, most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this was different. And, and I, I have that knowledge playing with these guys. Like, okay, I know all these guys. Some of these guys maybe voted for Romney. Some of these guys maybe voted for McCain. But that Trump was different. Yeah. And I hard support of Trump was different. Where even when, and, and it's not like we would have these conversations about politics all the time or ever, really. But sometimes, you know, you over here wanting to, that guy, like, yeah, I, um, I was watching the Trump rally on TV the other day, and you know, and I, I would just catch, I would just catch those strays. And so the chapter is about the week Trump, the week of the election, Trump wins. I'm devastated, like millions of other people were, and I have this game, this Thursday night game, Thursday night pickup, which I had never skipped. Like there were times when. My wife and I, you know, still only had one car. And my wife had had the car, so I caught like a jitney or an Uber to, to get like I wanted to play that badly. So there have been times like that. So this game, this regular pickup game was that precious to me. 
But that week, I didn't want to be around any white people. Mm-hmm. Like, not, not cool white people, not ally white people, no white people at all, which is tough in Pittsburgh. <laughs> because Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is white as fuck. Pittsburgh, you know, as I say in my book, Pittsburgh is so white that Rick James probably tried to snort it once in the 70s. <laughs> and, um, and so I had a dilemma. It's like, do I attend this game, which has, which for years had been my weekly source of catharsis, of self-care, of, 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 of even, you know, finding a, a source of, of, of creative energy? Or do I skip it? Because I know this Trump guy is there and I know that other white guys are there. And I just, I don't know what I would do in that circumstance. So I end up going to the game. I end up attending. And to make matters worse, the Trump guy is actually one of my favorite guys to play with too. <laughs> because he he plays a sort of he plays a sort of game where he's really unselfish. He makes the right pass. He's a great defensive player. He's the sort of guy that you that you like to play with. And so he has this, 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 I don't know, this persona on the court of being unselfish, being like team minded, being just a just a great guy that you want to have in the trenches with you, but off the court. He supports this court. maniac, this racist idiot, Nikan Poop. And, and so the chapter kind of deals with just that, that economy. And I also give like these scouting reports <laughs> on some of the regulars. I go really deep. <laughs> if you're not a basketball person, this is a tough chapter because I get really, really deep in the basketball. No, no, it's entertaining though. I'm, I'm, I'm not a basketball person, but I could, I, I, it, it was good. It was entertaining. Um, and I was like, wow. Uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and so, I did not let those guys know about that chapter. And, and a couple of those guys I'm, I'm not like great friends with, but I'm pretty cool with. I, I've known them since we played against each other in high school. In fact, they're the ones who invited me to start coming to, 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 the, to the pickup game. And I didn't, I didn't give anyone from that game a heads up about the chapter. I just wrote it. And then once the book was published, it existed. And you know, pre-COVID, I did start going back there, start playing back there. And, um, and, and it's funny because 2019, when the book was out, I was on tour. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't home. I, I just wasn't able to, once the book was out, I wasn't able to be home and play pickup ball. And so finally months, like we're, my book came out in March. And so we're talking like September, October. I finally am home and I'm available on a Thursday night to attend one of these games. So I go and I'm thinking, okay, I know some of these guys have read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how are they gonna, uh, well, uh, let's see, how, how's it gonna be? And they were cool about it. They they would joke with me. I use pseudonyms in the, in the chapter, but people who knew the guys knew who I was talking about. And so mm. they would refer to themselves as a pseudonym. Um, they would say certain parts of the scout report were off. <laughs> um, and now, but the Trump guy who, who still goes, we, he has never talked to me about the book. Mm. But, but one of the guys who's a regular was like, you know what? I think you were actually too kind to him. And the book. Wow. Wow. I think you let him off the hook of that. I think you were too kind because we give him a lot of shit about this shit too. And you, you could have gone harder. I mean, you 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 do you afford him um, some grace, and then there's the there's the other the liberal guy, and they, they hug at the end, and you know to them it's a to them it's a it's, it's a friendly competition where it's us, you know, it could be life or death. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't sure how to how to how to feel about that at the end because it's kind of like I wouldn't know what to do. You know, um, you had to make that decision. I I didn't. You know, at the at the time, I taught at a black I taught at a black college. <laughs> um, I um, I lived in a terrible neighborhood. It's all I could afford, um, and you know, a lot of times I'd be frustrated that you know that I was in that financial state that I had to live in that neighborhood, um, and I lived in that neighborhood because you know for my son to go to to the school he went to, 
Um, but at the same time, you know, at the at the the day after the election, I took my son to the bus stop. I looked around, and all all the black people and Latinos that made up the neighborhood, um, and I was like, <laughs> I, none of these people voted for Trump, yeah. you know. And, and at that moment, I felt I felt very very comfortable <laughs> being in this bad neighborhood. <laughs> And I um, and in that that week and in that moment, you know, I I I never had a greater appreciation for what I do for a living. Um, just in terms of I I don't any any engagement with white people is would be voluntary for me. Mm-hmm. Like I could just stay in the house all day. Now that wouldn't be fun <laughs> to do. <laughs> But I could have done that, you know, and I'm thinking about the, the black people who, who, who also experienced that week the same way we did, but who may have had to go to their corporate job mm-hmm. at, at yeah. the, or at the company or whatever, where they're surrounded by white people, white superiors, white people who they know voted a certain way and they, and they have to go to work that day. They have to be around those people for the rest of the week. Mm-hmm. You know, that, like, holy shit! Like, how how do you how do you how how do you manage that when you don't even have that space to be able to kind of remove or this that privilege to be able to right. like, um, you know, yeah. When you got call him black. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta call. Him. <laughs> call him, I'm, I'm black. I'm black today. You can't come to work. <laughs> Um, I guess this will be edited because I'm. I i want to ask how long do you want to? Because we've been going for about an hour. Um, I want to ask you, dude, uh, if, you know, before before we cut off, I want to ask you about your um um. So you you uh, how, how do you feel about the about our, about the time? Okay. Do about it's your um the essay um about your about your mother. Um, I recently lost my mother um, just a, little, a little over a year ago. Um, and, you know, someone, you know, you, you can imagine, it was, it's a pretty, pretty devastating thing um, to happen, even, even though um, you know it's gonna happen one day. Um, that, to me, that, you know, that was, that was the essay that, that, that moved me the most, um, you know, brought, brought me to tears toward, towards, the end of the, towards the end of the essay. Um, and I, you know, I just, I, I just, I just appreciate a lot of the insights, um, about the, the, the burdens, um, that you're, uh, you know, that, that you wrote, that you wrote about that your mother, um, carried. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was a, it's a beautiful elegy. I don't really know if I have a question, um, but, um, or, or I could finish by saying, just, just talk about the construction of that, that essay. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, my condolences about your mom a year ago that's that's pretty that's still pretty recent um still pretty you know it's it's been seven years now for me so it and it it does you know yeah my mom it was 2013 when she passed um and it it does it it gets better in some ways but then there's other times when i'll have like this accomplishment that i wish i would i wish i was i was able to witness her Witness, mm-hmm. you know, like she hasn't. No, she'll. I'll never be able to watch her interact with my children. Yeah, yeah. She, she just never met my children. Well, you know. Now, if you believe in afterlife, and I do, um, then my mom is is watching, is around, is watching. But I don't get to see that. I don't get to see her watching, um, mm-hmm. and I, 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 I miss that. Um, but yeah, the chapter about my mom, you know, so, so the book, the original title of the book was Nigga Neurosis. Right? And that's, that's, a, that's like a term I coined a few years ago to encapsulate the state of being where you are questioning how race impacted your treatment. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it could be in it, in the spectrum of behavior. It could be something like you're at like a breakfast spot eating pancakes and a server comes over and ask if you want hot sauce. And it's like, hot sauce? Oh, pancakes? Really? <laughs> <Were they? laughs> 
<laughs> so, so there's something like that. You're like, yeah, this is that. Are you asking me about hot sauce because I'm black, and you just listen to Beyonce? Um, so there's that. So yeah, the concept of Nigga Neurosis, um, which uh, talks about just this spectrum of of behavior, uh, where you're wondering, you know, how your race may have impacted your treatment. And the example I gave about the pancakes and the hot sauce is like, what the fuck? Does anyone eat pancakes with hot sauce? Does that even happen? <laughs> and um, and then you know, um, in January, December or January, whenever the latest Star Wars movie came out, um, my wife and I went on a double date to go see the movie, and it was day one, so you know it was packed or whatever, and we had to get assigned seats in the theater. So we get our tickets, we go in the theater, we sit down. And, you know, this is, it's, a, it's mostly white. I'd say there are 250 people there. Of the 250 people there, there are probably 20 black people. All right. And we get our seats in the front. And then right during the previews, one of the theater people comes and asks us if we're in the right seats. Oh, well. And, of course, our reaction is like, oh, oh, okay, you're really asking us because we're black, because holy shit, we're in the wrong seats. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we, yeah, we, we were, you know, we sat in the wrong seats, and the people that were next to us were in our seats, so we had to switch. Um, and again, that's that was a circumstance where we assumed that, okay, yeah, full theater, you pinpoint the only black people in here to ask if we're in the wrong seats, but we actually were in the wrong seats. So there's that. But then there's also you're driving and you look in the rear view mirror and you see a police car back there. And you don't know, maybe the car, maybe he, maybe the cop is just following you, just happens to be behind you. Maybe mm-hmm. you just have to the same street. He just happens to be behind you. Maybe he is following you. And then it's like, okay, is he following me because I'm black? Is he following me because I made a wrong, I didn't turn on my turn signal or, or I don't know, I, I was speeding or something, but is he following me because I'm black is a part of that equation where you're just wondering, okay, how, what's about to happen? Because if that is true, if he is following me because I'm black, what happens if he stops me? Mm. And so that concept of nigga neurosis, you know, it, it's, a, it's a recurring theme throughout the book. And I, I, the chapter with my mom really, I guess, puts a, puts a human face on it because my mom, um, that of lung cancer, um, in 2013, um, and she had been diagnosed a year earlier on stage four. But in the years before she passed, she had spent so much time in doctor's offices, emergency rooms, seeing specialists and a PCP. And they would tell her, you know, she needs to get more exercise. She needs to drink more water, mm. drink less pop, you know, and all of these, these, those are great things to tell anyone, really. But I do wonder, even now, seven years later, if my mom's race impacted how seriously they treated her. Now, when she was diagnosed, she got top-notch, she got top-notch treatment from that moment on. Mm-hmm. Before she was diagnosed, before she was diagnosed, you know, if this was, if my mom were a white woman, a six year old white woman, would they have done a test? Would they have ordered, uh, taken her to see a specialist or done a test that they didn't, you know, have her take? And these are the sort of questions that, that again, still seven years later exist in my head and they 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 don't exist without context because we know mm. 
we know the history of medicine and how medicine has treated black Americans. We know that black female slaves were experimented on and that many, you know, many like, you know, many discoveries in gynecology happen specifically because of that. Torture, basically. Yeah, torture. They were torture. You know, with no yeah. anesthesia. You know, we know that even today that there are doctors who believe that Black people have a supernatural tolerance for pain. Okay, where they might not be, you know, you think of racism or white people sometimes think of racism and think of, you know, Klan, think nigger, think Nazi, but don't necessarily think of the, the doctor who is quote unquote progressive, quote unquote liberal, but still believes that we are stronger inherently and that we could take more, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so all of that comes to a head, you know, you know, comes to a, like a bit of a culmination with the chapter about my mom. And that's why, you know, I mean, I, I, I wrote about it because, you know, it was, it was a, a very, you know, important detail, you know, experience in my life, but also because it, it fit this, this, this narrative of, of America killing us, basically. Uh, the, the other thing, the other thing about that essay is that you, you I mean, it is a, a remarkable act of empathy and you start thinking about her life as a woman and how that affected, how that affected her, her responsibilities as a wife and as a mother um, and, and just as, uh, as a woman um, and, uh, and these things that you'll never know. I mean, that, that adds like a gender neuroses as well um, to, the, the, to, 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 the, um, to the whole essay. Um, and, you know, you know, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different story than, than, uh, than, than the story, you know, of, of, of my mother. Um, but I, um, you know, but I, but I felt it, you know, I felt, I felt it there. It was, you know, it's a remarkable act of empathy. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and the gender, the gender neurosis part is something that, that is new to me, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and new, I, I knew, I mean, I don't mean like yesterday, but I mean within the last four or five years in terms of just being able to step outside myself and recognize that, you know what, yes, yes, we black men, you know, get this shit badly, get this shit terribly, but black women get the racism too with the misogyny, mm. with the sexism, with the sexual violence, with the domestic violence also. And we don't right. always have empathy. Yeah, and that's and, 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 and support. And, and that's a that's a part of it that that I had to develop. That's a part of it that just didn't, you know. I, I think that my my activism or my my thoughts about about race about racism were very self contained, and, and they still they still are. I mean, they still are to a point. I mean, I'm not going to completely absolve myself you know, from, from those thoughts or from those feelings because those remnants of that are still within me and it takes work to, to, empathy takes work, it mm. does. You know, particularly when you are a vulnerable person, you know, I, I think, and, and, and I think that sometimes you could have a tendency to, to think that your vulnerability is singular and that you are, you know, it becomes almost like this ego egoist thing where, okay, if I'm getting this, then that means that I'm getting it the worst. Um, and that, that is just not true. There's, I mean, it, and it's not just the thing where people are, are, are saying that it's not just a feeling based. This isn't true. No, that there are actual statistics. There's actual data that proves mm. that this is not true. There's actual fields of study. <laughs> that right, will tell right. you that this is this is not true at all. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm meaning to ask you, um, how did you come? Like the world does not deserve. Like the world does not um, require you. What does that title mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I come to that? Yeah, you know, I think um, how I came to that. Um, was I was I was I was listening to NPR one day. It was weekend edition, and I wish I could find the interview, but I, I I'll never find it. 
um, there was a musician on, I, I don't listen to that type of music. So I don't, um, I, you know, I was, I was more interested in it just because it was an interesting interview. Um, and um, he, he had apparently been part of a band and so it comes to the end of the interview and the interviewer is kind of like, you know, I feel like she was asking a question that she wanted to ask for the entire interview, almost like she wasn't really listening to anything, just wait to get to that moment where she could say, so when are you getting back with your band? You know, he comes quiet for a little bit. Then he's like, you know, it's just not, the world doesn't require that. That's just not something the world needs, you know? Mm-hmm. So and it's kind of like, I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And I started thinking about that. I started thinking about, yeah, you know, I, 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 my focus was on music at that moment. I started thinking, yeah, Outkast is making terrible music. I think Idlewild had just come out. Outkast is making terrible music right now. Um, but I, you know, if they never make another good album, then and, and I haven't made an album since. But if they have, if they never made another good album, what they had is is, is good enough. And Wu Tang never made another good album. What they had is enough. And I started extrapolating it out. And I started thinking, you know, Stevie Wonder, Bob Marley, they are. Um, they are they are important to my life, right? Uh, to a lot of people's lives. Uh, if they never existed, we wouldn't know. <laughs> and then I started thinking about all kinds of other things. Um, and I was thinking that each each individual one of us um, is um, is is uh, is is not is not essential. We have to sort of think about ourselves as um, as, as part of a continuum, and it's sort of a freeing freeing notion. That um, that we're not the most important thing, and you know we're the most important thing going in in ourselves. You know, you know if if if, if you have a pain, everything stops. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's not that. But it's um, but the world doesn't stop. The world keeps going. Um, and um, and I and I think that it's it's a it's a to me it's a it's a freeing it's a freeing notion to really think about that. Um, you know, to really you know to to really think of yourself as as you know, just one you know one tiny blade of grass, and not not the lawn, you know. Yeah, and 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 it, and it connects back to the concept of empathy because once you're able to to realize that you know what I I I I'm just a part of this tapestry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like right. I, I, am, I am not I'm not the picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. the then it then I think that that does help you know enable or allow you to to consider people who exist outside of you, who exist mm-hmm. outside of your experience, who exist outside of your sensibility and be able to be like, you know what? Yeah, just because a thing is good for me or just because a thing is bad for me doesn't mean it would be good or bad for someone else. Um, there's, there's a moment in, in the book where one of the characters is having a lap dance and it becomes a, like a psychedelic experience. And, and he hears the voice that tells him, you're the most important person that ever existed but everybody else is also the most important person that ever existed. And I think that that's kind of the essence of, 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 of well, not the essence of the book, but one of the essences of the book. Yeah. I, yeah. The, the, the psychology behind that and that sort of psychedelic experience, I think I, I I've been, I, I've been reluctant to admit this out loud, <laughs> but since you went there first, I will. Uh, is that, you know, we none of us have really any evidence that the world exists outside of us. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, we have belief that it does, but for all for all I know, the world could end as soon as I close. Like when I go to sleep and close my eyes. That's it. That, that, the world, that everything that exists is completely self-contained. Is completely contained within me. And and you can right. say and you can probably say the same thing uh-huh. because you don't know what ex- I mean. You're you're told what existed before you existed, and mm. you assume that existence will continue when you're gone. Right. You are not. <laughs> I mean, there's no way of being completely one thousand percent sure of that. No. Okay. Um. Where and that, and that puts us in the same position as, as like my 19 month old son, where yeah he he still he that's what he still believes that the world that the world revolves around him that the world mm-hmm. literally revolves around him, and and we get older, and we get more context and we get more experience and more education that tells us oh that's not true, but you we have to trust that 
experience that contest and that education because again you know when i when i when i close my eyes if i close my eyes and close my ears the world stops existing <laughs> okay. well i mean it, it's and, and 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 then you know how you treat other people it becomes a choice you know um you mm-hmm. could do you with that information you could take that information and say i can be a shitty to anybody um as as, as i want because they don't really exist you know um mm-hmm. and you know that might be a short life, um, but it, it's a, it's a choice you can make. Um, but then uh, we can take that other, other information and say, on on faith, I believe these other people actually do exist in the world. Actually, doesn't exist. I've I've never been to China, but I'm assuming China exists. Um, and um, and and then you know it's a, it's a it's 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 a choice each each and every one of us has to make every single every single moment <laughs> because um, like you said, there's no there is there's no guarantee of of uh, of, of anything um it, it, there's no there's no way you can actually guarantee and prove it so you have to really act on act on faith yeah you have to act on faith you have to you have to believe um and and again that faith and that belief you know in other people in in the possibility of other yeah. possibilities that's 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 where that empathy happens and i think you know i keep coming back to this concept of empathy because that's where the best work comes from. Like I, I, I think that the best work, that your work, and we're you know we talk about KSA, even like Samantha Irby, um, um, Monty Perry, Brittany Cooper. I mean, I, and I'm thinking of just people I know who are just writing this tremendous work right now, Bossy Ekby, and it comes yeah. from it comes from empathy. It comes yeah. from it comes from you know, trying to find that grace for themselves, right? And also recognizing that there's an entire world that exists outside of you. Like, you can't, like, you just, I don't even know how you can work, how you can write without that recognition, you know? And and, and there are people who do that. I mean, fucking Donald Trump's sons have books, but you (laughs) you can't write a good book. Yeah. Without, without being deeply empathetic um, or, yeah. or at least without making the effort and perhaps the book is about the effort but an empathy well, has, to be, has to be a part of it in some capacity I, mean, I think that comes back to what you said earlier about going criticizing yourself being more critical of yourself than than anyone else right because you really have mm-hmm. to think about you know how you know how you uh, have have harmed other people in in these situations, and how you, um, uh, you know your your role in things. You know, <laughs> you know you got you know your essays about you know how how you how you and your wife you know got together, um, and um, you know I, I think you were incredibly you know critical you know of uh, of you know certain of certain things. I don't, don't want to give it away for the reader, um, but. Um, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's an, it's an act of empathy to say that, you know, I, I, you know, I fucked up in this situation, um, um, but I'm gonna continue, you know, but this is how I have to move forward, even though I fucked up, you know. Um, I mean, it's it's an act of empathy, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit more cynical, <laughs> too, just about myself, but it's, 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 yes, it's a sincere act of empathy. But, but it also makes for a more compelling read. <laughs> it, it, it also, like the functionality part of it matters. Um, and and I and I ask myself, would I be, would I would I would I would I be as empathetic? Would I would I be as vulnerable if there wasn't a, a tangible validation <laughs> in it? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it make it, yes, I, I want to be a better person, obviously. But do I still have that same compulsion to be a better person if I also didn't know that being a better person was going to make me a better writer, too? Mm. Does, does it, does, you know, because I, 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 I don't think, I mean, we're, we're incentive-driven entities, humans are. And and so, what is my incentive for for you know for 
being vulnerable, for examining this way, for developing empathy, you know, and I, I want to tell myself that, oh yeah, I'm just doing this because it's the right thing. And it's, it, you know, I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart, but I, 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 I can't, I can't go, I can't go this far than just stop right there. It's like, okay, if I'm going to really try to be as self-aware and as vulnerable as, as I can be, then I need to go a little bit further. It's like, okay, why does this empathy exist? And that, and you know, the piece that I wrote recently that you referenced, um, the VSB piece about um, I'm not brave kind of touches on that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it, it's not a coincidence that my work has gotten progressively more vulnerable, more transparent and all of that as I've gotten more success. And 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 in all these other you know physical and and metaphysical validations that exist, and, and I feel like okay, brave is writing the same way when I am twenty six, and still, you know, and still have like my my income is very tenuous, my living situation is tenuous, my dating life is like is awkward and weird. And so if I were to write with that vulnerability and, and exist and live with that vulnerability, then instead of still performing this, you know, hyper hetero masculinity that I, you know, that I thought was necessary to project to the, to the world, um, that would have been brave. Mm. That would have been more brave. But now it's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm 40, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, 41, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. I get paid good money to write and to create and to be vulnerable. So yeah, I have, I have these incentives that exist now. And so, and so is it, is it still brave to, to, to do that when you have an, an actual tangible reason why you're doing it? Yeah. I mean, and it would, it would take me, it would take a lot longer than we have to, to unpack that. But I think, I, I can think of a lot of I can think of a lot of people. Um, Kanye West is one example. Through success, it seems to have have have, have made him less connected, less less empathetic in in, in many ways. Um, and um, and and you know, you go on Twitter. Uh, there is often an incentive there to be less to, to be less empathetic. Um, and and and. Uh, and, and you know a lot of people have gotten real world real world gains out out of that. So uh, you know to 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 defend to defend Damon Young, I would say that, that you're still making a choice um, to to go in that to go in that to go in that direction um, of becoming a better of of becoming a better person. Where, whereas there are um, there are incentives in, in other parts of of the world. Um, you know the you know. Or we can look at the we can look at the president as an as an extreme example. Um, yeah. um, a lack of empathy has has has, uh, has gotten him um, vocal vocal support in some sectors. Well, and that but and, and that ties back to the concept of incentive because throughout his life he's had no he's had he always had his incentive to continue to be the person that he is, where it's been mm. reinforced. You know, it was reinforced by his dad. It was reinforced by people around him, his family, um, and then reinforced by the people who, you know, when he became, you know, successful or whatever, wanted to be around him. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he's never been like disincentivized, you know, to be anything other than what he is um, today. Um, and, and for, you know, and yeah, incentive works differently for a 70 year old, you know, privileged white person, white man, than it does for a 40 year old black, you know, 40 year old nigga from the hood. Um, and, you know, it's, all right, it's pivot. And this, this will take a bit longer. So I'm just gonna touch on this a little bit here. I have a theory about Kanye. <laughs> okay. I wanna, I wanna say that I wanna say for a book right now, but I, I've been working through this. And so, all right. I, I, I had been, I had been 
a member, a resident, a landowner on Kanye Allen for forever. <laughs> like I, I like you know when people talk about you know make this distinction between the old Kanye and the new Kanye, and I guess mm. new Kanye started after 808s when people make that distinction with his music. Mm-hmm. Thinking, you know, college dropout, graduation, late registration, that's the old Kanye. Wait, 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 people... wait. Oh, wait, when is the Dark Twisted? So Dark Twisted Fantasy is the new Kanye? I, th- I think when people think of the new Kanye, they can they consider that, they consider it ways to start at a new Kanye. Okay. Um, when this conversation happens in people's heads or or online or out loud about the new Kanye, the old Kanye, whatever. Um, and I think that his best work is, I think new Kanye has created his best work because, because, mm-hmm. um, I think, um, my beautiful dark Twisted of fantasy is one of the top five hip hop albums that's ever been created. And it's a work I, of genius. yeah. And I love you. I say that very reluctantly because I'm not on Kanye. Adam. Yeah. And I <laughs> love you. And so, but the thing, so just getting back to my beautiful dark Twisted of fantasy, when people talk about, you know, Kanye is broken right now. Okay, he is. Like, his, his head, his actions, you know, he's, he's having these mental health issues, but he also has this anti-blackness that is, is existing within him. And mm-hmm. all of these are connecting. And he's also making more money now than he ever has because of his clothes. Mm-hmm. So this is just a very volatile and very dangerous concoction that is happening right now. Um, and so people are talking about like the shift to Kanye, like, okay, what, what quote unquote broke him. They refer to his mom past and that kind of decentering him. Sometimes people refer to Kim Kardashian's influence on him, which is some bullshit really, because, you know, if, if anything, you know, I, I don't want to be up here defending Kim Kardashian, but <laughs> she seems to have, uh, I don't know, been a positive influence on it. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a really weird thing to say out loud. But <laughs> I, 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 I think the thing that, that turned Kanye was my beautiful Dark Twisted of Fantasy and chasing white validation from that mm. because I, I think you know you remember he had the video he had the he had the movie for that he, he came mm. out with a 35 minute long movie it's still on youtube you know mm. kind of monthly's lemonade and all of that where he had a movie and i think he expected this album to be his thriller yeah to be the album that doesn't just get critical lines but is an essential part of the culture of the zeitgeist from that moment forward. And it's, igno- it's still acknowledged critically as a great album. It still won some Grammys. And I think he still sold, what, two or three million copies of it. But two or three million copies is not 20 million. It's not, yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, the Gram- and he, didn't won, he didn't win the big Grammys, like record of the year, album of the year, song of the year. Like the, the, the biggies, he didn't win any of those. And I, I think that chasing that, 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 that sort of validation did a thing to him. Uh, I think that, Go ahead. I think that, it, it, I, I don't know, I, I, I it's, have to it's a theory, theory I'll, I'll say it's a theory that I am still workshopping <laughs> in my head. I, there's, know, there's, something, <laughs> there's something to that in that, and that there's it came to a point where he you know he is um he decided that the you know as, as Malcolm X would say the white man's ice is colder mm-hmm. um and um and there was a point where he you know he started acting started using a white voice in the interviews you know um that was so, you know, that was so bizarre and he started like, he started so openly bad. begging openly begging um bill, white billionaires you know to invest in in, in his stuff and it, it was and it was, it was, you know, it was, you know, it's kind of like, I think, I think, um, I think Kiense may have an essay about this or, um, um, uh, I'm not sure, but there was someone who had, a, who had an essay of, of, about him chasing this, this, this white, this, this white validation. And it just, it, you know, it just becomes, you know, it just became, to me, it became very, very sad up to that point where it's kind of like, 
it, it's kind of like you sort of, sort of discounting a lot of of what brought him here, you know, um, in, 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 the, in the colloquial, you forgot where he came from. We started discounting that, um, you know, the, the, the culture that, that he is, uh, that he, that he is a, a part of to, to, to try to chase, to try to chase that ring. And, um, you know, at, at, at this, at this turn, at this juncture, there was a point where I, you know, I was very, you know, just like, you know, fuck Kanye. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I do think that the, um, that particular mental illness that, that that he's that he says he suffers from has 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 the uh, reputation uh, of turning uh, of you know it almost uh, you know it, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn but it turning you know it, almost like installing a, a new a new a new system <laughs> within you um, uh, whereas you're you know uh, you know you, you see people suffering suffering from this and they're saying things that. That, that they they don't they wouldn't say um and you don't you know it's it's, it's hard to it's hard for me to say um you know what what is uh where that begins um where, where Kanye begins and 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 uh and this uh and this problem is is, is this mental illness is, is is sort of taking over so I, so I you know I've tried to recede from 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 you know outward you know outward criticisms and you know there's a certain point where I was like there's anti-blackness and there's mental illness, and 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 they're not connected. But I think that's a little too simplistic. I, I think that there's, uh, you know, I, I think that they're, they, you know, his his outward anti-blackness is is weaved in with the with, with this mental illness, and um, we have to approach it with empathy, um, and um, and not laughter, and sort of ignore it, and, and and sort of you know almost you know ignore it, and hopefully he gets the help he gets the help that he, he needs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that album, you know, and I, I, I bailed off Kanye Island after 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 college drop. I just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> so you weren't um, there. After, so you weren't there at all, basically. I went left, back. I went back and listened to the college, album. You left after college dropout. <laughs> I went back and listened to these albums. Eight Hundred Eight Heartbreaks is one of my favorite albums right now. I listen to it. I listen to it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, and and you know, Dark Twisted Fantasy is a work of genius and uh, what you say is 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 true is you know it, it's true that it's a work of genius and it's true that i think that he he, he thought that this was that this was going to get him the the, val- the thrill of validation it's not, to me it's not an album that you listen to every day it's an album you admire rather than an album you live um you know like thrill them off the wall you live those albums you i, I you know you know I, well, you, I, you, you you admire you admire dark twisted fans and i think you know and i think that gets to to the point about just the danger of chasing that white validation, that mainstream validation, yeah. because you, because then you you create work that is inherently self conscious. Not all work is self conscious to a point, but you, mm-hmm. but but when you are chasing that validation, and that's your that is your that is your only audience, or the most important audience, you're creating a work that is self consciously concerned with how it'll be perceived by white people. And mm-hmm. that is just, that is just uh, an insufficient um, way of creating things. It's it, you're just you you again you you create a thing that is meant to be meant to be awarded, meant to mm-hmm. be admired, but not meant to be felt. Wow. Um, yeah. And and there are some songs on Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy that I, that I do return to, like Hell of a Life. I, I return to that. A, a, a lot, but but yeah, as in far as the album totality, it is an album that is very self consciously award me. Look look at look at look at look at all the look at. I'm I'm putting Daft Punk and Rihanna on the same track. Look at this. Don't you see what I'm doing with this? Uh, um, and 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 Rick, I'm putting Daft Punk, Rihanna, Rick Ross, and Drake and Elton John on the same track. And then Chris uh-huh. Rock. <laughs> okay, yeah. and um, and so yeah, that I I I I think it's a I think yes, the conversation about Kanye's anti-blackness cannot exist without cannot cannot exist without an accompanying conversation about mental illness. And, yeah. and there are people who are more equipped to have a conversation than I am. Like Bossy, I be right. has written beautifully about about you know bipolar disorder um danielle belton who's um the EIC at the root 
has has also written about um, her, you know, dealing with being bipolar and also written about Kanye and, and the connection to that. Um, but more than, but aside from that, I just think that he is a cautionary tale of what happens yeah. when black people chase white validation. Yeah. And, and your work, your work might be awarded, your work might be lauded, but your work, your work may also not be as robust as it could possibly be and then you, it's like a dog chasing a tail you, like you're never there's always going to be another thing there's always going to be another level of this validation that you're just that you're going to be re- trying to reach and trying to get and you're just never going to get so you'll never you know you'll never be satisfied yeah 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 uh, last, last, last thing. Um, Nigga Neurosis. Who, whose idea was it to change the title? Um, <laughs> it was a collective idea. Um, it was. Yeah. Um, it came. So, I sold it. I sold the book with that title. Um, my agent loved it. My editor Denise Oswald and my agent Tony McKinnon. You know, they both loved it. Denise is white, and she's my editor at um at Echo. Um, but I guess Denise spoke to her people at Barnes and Noble and her people at Amazon and all the you know, the major booksellers who were like, Yeah, we can't wait for Damon's book. We're excited to have it, we're excited to promote it, but yeah, um about that title. I don't know how banner ads with nigga <laughs> in seventy two point one. You know, in the seventies there were movies with that title all, all over yeah, Times yeah. Square. <laughs> I don't know I don't know I don't know that's gonna look. So, uh, and she, and she was like, you know, you, if you want to keep it, you can, but I'm just letting you know. Mm. And so I made a decision to, um, to, to change it to something. And, and I think that what doesn't kill you makes you blacker is a more fitting, is a more fitting title. Um, and that came to me while I was doing some edits. I was, um, I agree. I think it's a better it, title. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and there was, I, I have to admit. Not just for marketability. Not just there, working, also, but I think there was also a bit of a troll, trollishness with me choosing Nigga Neurosis because I like envisioned, I always had, had this fantasy in my head of like white people struggling with it and me being entertained by it. Like it was always like I would be on like CNN and like Anderson <laughs> Cooper. Anderson Cooper is like, so um, your book. Uh, n- Ninja? Nin, can I say ninja? Nin, ninja neurosis. Can you tell me about your how, n- 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 work? I, I just, I had that fantasy in my head. I wanted to recreate that. So it was a bit of, that title was a bit of a troll. I have a story in my book called The Nigga Knockers, and, and that happens a lot. Um, and I, I, it entertains me. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I'm entertained by how white people engage with that word. I am when 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 white people are, are trying to figure out how to say it, and I'm not giving in, and I'm like I'm like I'm not gonna give you any help. I'm, you're just gonna. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just gonna sit here and let you figure it out on your own how to how to say this. <laughs> so go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh man, but um, I um, you know, we got a chance to meet. Uh, last year at the uh, what was it the Miami Miami Book Fest got a chance to hang yeah, out. You bought me tacos, man. Thanks. I, I bought you tacos. I don't. No, you I don't pay for that. them, and then I you pay for them, and then you refuse you refuse the money. I was oh. trying I was trying to give you, so I was like, all right, this is this okay. is my man, this is my nigga now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you. I think we we had all had a few we had all had a few drinks, so I don't. <laughs> I don't, remember, I don't remember the tacos, but um, but it was it great. Was you know, I um, hopefully when this ends, whenever this ends, we're able. Like, I wanted, um, you know, I actually wanted to bring you to Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like. I had a, I had a plan to bring you to Pittsburgh. I, um, I was going to do a, a Black Book Fest here. And oh, nice. I, and uh, it was going to be me. Do you know Disha Filioff? Oh yeah. oh yeah! Oh yeah! So it was me, Disha, and Tony Norman. The book is incredible. 
Yeah, yeah, thesis, thesis, incredible. So me, church lady. yeah, me uh, and um, Tony Norman, who is a columnist at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, we come together to do this Black Book Fest, and we were going to call it the Black, the Black, the Black Lit Fan Fest. And we were just going to invite, we had like a list of names of like 25 to 30 names of people we wanted for sure to be adding. We were going to have panels and talks and it was going to be like a two day event at the August Wilson Center downtown. Um, and you were one of the people that we wanted, that we were like, yeah, we will, whatever it costs to get you here, we will do that. So I, I would have been there and I would have been on, I, w- I would have tried to, I would have been on Wiley, Wiley Avenue looking, looking for, <laughs> for our Esther's house. I'm an August Wilson yeah. fanatic. And so whenever, whenever all this ends, just, you know, just, uh, yeah. This this know that that's coming, and all right, I'm I'm I'm, I'm 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 there. Okay, I'm there. Great talking to you, bro. Yeah, yeah, same. Huh? Stay stay safe. Stay socially yeah, distant. Mask up, mask up. Mask up. All right. All right. All right. Peace. All right. Peace.